with thousands, not probably have, of nonprofits in the since I've been at Georgetown, which is almost 20 years ago. Thousands. And every time I do, I always say, what are your top challenges? And almost every time, not every time, but almost every time, uh, I am told that how do we measure impact? How do we know we're having, ch we're making change? What does that look like? And that's the questions and issues they always raise with me. I don't have the answers. And so, um, I've known Eleanor for a very long time, El Eleanor Ibrahim, who's sitting there. And um, when I saw that he wrote a book, um, I thought, who better than to bring him here? You have their bio, so I'm not going to read them for you. But I do want to say something about the book. Uh, you have it, it's Measuring Social Change. If you don't have it, go get it. Measuring Social Change, Performance and Accountability in a Complex World. Today's world, as you know, is really complex. And so are nonprofits. And I really do think this book is really important because unlike a lot of other books that are on evaluation, measuring this, that, and the other, this one really gives you something to grasp onto. It gives you the tools. It's practical. And um, I'm encouraging my students to read it too. So I'm going to turn it over to Nate, who's going to introduce our panelists. But uh, before I do that, I want to say the other thing that's special about today is that we have um, cross departments, cross centers collaboration on today. We have our center, we have the center, uh, the Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation, we have the college, and I hope we have other opportunities to do this. I'm turning it over to Nate, who is the interim executive director of the Beck Center. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. So we're actually going to dive right in. I know we have limited amount of time, so um, we talked a little bit about um, framing this conversation a bit so we get some of the themes of the book. Um, but we're going to keep it pretty provocative. Um, so I would just uh, put a call out there for you all to be brave and ask your own questions. Um, so I'm just going to have a few to start the conversation. Um, so, you know, Elnor, measurement, as Kathy was mentioning, um, is becoming more and more in vogue, if you will. I think there's more of an emphasis both on the funding side as well as on the, the nonprofit side to really measure what matters. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, as you shared a little bit in your book, there are underlying assumptions that people often have around measurement. Um, I w I'm curious if you can talk about what some of those assumptions may be and what um, are maybe wrong about them. Okay, <clears throat> wonderful question. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you all for being here. Um, thanks to the Beak Center, Nate, Lisa Hall, um, and the CPNL, Kathy, um, uh, Dean Barbara. Uh, wonderful to be with you. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing I want to say is that when I first started writing this book in earnest about four years ago, I never thought a topic like measurement or measuring social change would attract a crowd like this. <laughs> right? And uh, you know, maybe Washington is a special place where it will attract um, you know, measurement nerds, but um, it's wonderful to see this kind of a turnout for a topic um, of this nature. <clears throat> you know, in terms of assumptions, um, you know, let me refer to a, a philosopher, um, Honora O'Neill. She's a philosopher at the University of Cambridge. She did a series of lectures for BBC Radio 15, 16 years ago called A Question of Trust. She was looking at the public sector, but I think it applies to nonprofits, to social enterprises, to businesses. Um, her concern was that we have such assumptions about about accountability, kind of the bigger idea in which measurement is based, um, that we, we tend to assume that more accountability is necessarily better. And it's worth pausing on that assumption, um, because it seems to me that there's a dark side to accountability. We can get so focused on measuring and complying with procedures that we lose sight of why we're doing it in the first place. Um, and so, 
a compliance-driven accountability and a compliance-driven measurement, I think, is the wrong way to go. Um, and Honor O'Neill sort of asked whether we could actually create what she called more intelligent forms of accountability. And that was part of the, part of the inspiration for this book um, as a way of saying, OK, so if it's not going to be compliance driven, could accountability and measurement be strategy driven? And what would that look like? Um, and so the book lays out four strategies, four archetypes of strategy. And if you're a leader or a manager, you have to pick among them. Um, and I'm just going to list them, and we'll talk about one or two of them, I think, in more detail. But there's a niche strategy, an integrated strategy, an emergent strategy, and an ecosystem strategy. Um, and I devote a chapter to each of these throughout the book. Um, and, uh, but I think we're going to focus primarily on the ecosystem strategy in this conversation. But I think there's a lot of assumptions about what we can do to make measurement and accountability actually re useful to leaders for executing change and also for keeping our, our eye on the ball of what it is that we want to be accountable for. So let's set the stage for some of this conversation. So Scott, you're a nonprofit leader. Elnor, you're a widely cited academic. Feels like a little bit like an unlikely pairing. Um, <laughs> how did you two meet? Um, let, like, give us a little bit of, of context, um, Scott. OK, I'll, I'll go for it. Yeah, no, I'm, so I'm Scott Schenkelberg. I'm the CEO of Miriam's Kitchen, and I've been there for about 17 years. Um, Miriam's Kitchen is actually really close to Georgetown. In fact, some Georgetown students have volunteered at Miriam's over the years, faculty members, et cetera. We're about 1.1 miles, about 1.1 miles away um, in Foggy Bottom. Um, and Miriam's Kitchen, for most of its existence, was a feeding program for people experiencing homelessness. Um, and when I got there, they had just started moving into doing case management, which really meant, oh, hey, meals aren't enough to really change your life demonstrably. Let's bring in clinicians, et cetera, to help you and who know the resources, ultimately, possibly, to get you into housing. And so at that juncture of about 2004, I never can remember exactly That's the right time. Right. Yeah. So I've been there a couple years at that point. Um, Alnor was at Virginia Tech, and he had a group of graduate students who wanted to do some kind of an evaluations project focusing on a, a subset of nonprofits focused on homelessness. And so I think it was through the Center for Nonprofit Advancement that you reached out to try and find some people. At that moment in my existence at Miriam's Kitchen, I was being asked constantly by our board of directors, like, how do you know anything? that you're doing is actually being effective. You can count the number of meals. You can count the number of people who come in for case management services. And we keep spending more and more money on this stuff, but we really don't know how the long, what long-term outcomes are or any kind of outcome beyond the outputs of meals, et cetera. And at that point in our evolution, I was flummoxed. I was like, I don't think there's any way we're ever going to be able to measure outcomes for folks. So out of like a, a bolt of lightning, Elnor and his grad <laughs> students arrived and you know, was coming into this you know, thorny problem of like, how do we figure out what the outcomes are for people? Um, and I, would, I thought, oh, you know, ultimately, they'll come up with something. You know, they're bright. They're academics. They'll come up with something that we have not come up with. And so what was the rest of the story, on that? <laughs> <laughs> the short version is we came up with nothing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, 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 so think of this as a kind of as a managerial problem. Um, you've got a, a, an organization that's serving warm meals. That's pretty much what they do, right? Several hundred delicious, by the way, high quality meals, yeah. right? So quality control, very high standards. Um, and you know, the question that Scott was asking us was, what can we reasonably measure? Um, you take any emergency services organization, right? Miriam's Kitchen at that point in time, as mm -hmm. a case in point, all you can reasonably measure, all that your strategy, it's what I call a niche strategy. It's a highly focused thing. It's really one thing, maybe a couple of things that you're doing. Um, and if it's an emergency services, it's short term. All it really enables you to do is to deliver short-term results. And you know, within the sector, we have this sort of pejorative stance that short-term results are not good enough. And yet, 
turns out they're actually pretty critical. And so a warm meal to somebody in need is an essential service. Um, God forbid, if I had a heart attack right now, right, because it's a warm room and there's lots of eyes on me, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you'd call 911, an ambulance would pick me up. We know from the research that if the response time is 9 to 12 minutes, uh, your chances of survival from a cardiac event go up substantially as, if it's, as compared to if it's longer than that. So if you're an ambulance service, you're going to measure outputs. You're going to measure response time. It's a meaningful measure. And so there's certain kinds of interventions where actually short-term metrics make a great deal of sense. Um, and in the book, I sort of asked that question, when does it make sense and when do you actually want to measure the long-term mm -hmm. outcomes? And so to come back to sort of 2004, 2005, um, when I placed a graduate student with Miriam's Kitchen, you know, she did an inventory of everything they were collecting data on. You know, we tried to look at the theory of change. We looked at what they were actually doing. We looked at their funder reports. Um, and we concluded they're doing it right. They really couldn't be measuring more than outputs. Mm -hmm. It was all the strategy enabled you to do. Um, and so the relationship between strategy and measurement, at least that's how I frame it now, was very clear. Um, and in that sense, you could think of, for that strategy, that set of outputs being delivered was actually high performance. And you could scale it. Um, and if you did more stuff, you would be expanding the scope, but you would lose the focus and potentially the quality. You would have to pay attention to all of that. Um, and so we came back to Scott and we said, here's the, your inventory, here's what you've been collecting, here's what you've been doing over the years. Really, you can just measure outputs. And he replied and he said, could you write a memo to my board saying that? <laughs> <laughs> so indeed we did. I think I still have a copy of it somewhere. Yeah. Um, but it got me thinking, right, that, okay, so what are other kinds of settings where actually outputs are a perfectly appropriate measure? Mm -hmm. And I didn't have strategy as a way of framing it at the time. Um, but eventually, yeah. several years later, um, I was teaching at Harvard Business School at the time uh, in, I don't know what year. 2011. 2011, 2012, around then. Um, in an executive program for nonprofit leaders, and Scott showed. Right? Like a and ghost. So, like a ghost, <laughs> yes, from the past. Um, we were both a little bit older, a little bit less hair, yeah. um, but uh, we connected. And he said to me, I'm here because we're rethinking our strategy. We're going through a fundamental shift in our theory of change. And we're trying to understand how we can see the bigger picture and perhaps play a role in it. So this was a strategic shift. So we stayed in touch, and eventually Miriam's Kitchen became a chapter in this book right. to map this shift from a niche to an ecosystem strategy. Yeah. yeah, so expand upon that, because you have a whole chapter devoted to the ecosystem strategy. I want to, maybe if you wouldn't mind framing one of the four elements, um, as you mentioned at the top, around specifically what is an ecosystem approach. And then I'd love to also follow up with you, um, Scott, and get a little bit of a, a taste for what it was, was like to transition from a, sure. a niche strategy to an ecosystem. Yep. Yeah, so, so if you, to be a little bit abstract for a moment, so bear with me. Um, there's, there's kind of two variables that I think of when I look at the strategy of an organization. One is, what is the uncertainty about cause and effect? Right? So how well do we know whether A leads to B leads to C? Right? How well is that laid out? And what is the research evidence around that? And so if, that's, if we know sort of the cause-effect relationships fairly well, then the causal uncertainty is low. Um, if we don't really know what's going on, then the causal uncertainty is high. Um, the other variable is control over outcomes. So regardless of whether, you, whether how well you know causality functions, how much control do you have over different pieces of the puzzle to deliver outcomes? So a niche strategy, the first one, sort of the original Miriam's Kitchen 1.0, um, is low uncertainty about cause and effect. Because they're serving meals to people. It's emergency services. 
that's not rocket science, right? Mm -hmm. and, the, and the cause effect chain is immediately observable. Similarly with the ambulance service. Um, so low uncertainty. Control over long-term outcomes is also low, right? So there's no way that Miriam's Kitchen 1.0 could have control over, over outcomes related to ending homelessness, getting people out of chronic homelessness. Because there's so many other pieces of the puzzle that we may not understand. Um, you know, mental health counseling and services, substance abuse, sort of financing related issues, housing, um, job training, you name it. Um, and so there's just a little piece of that bigger puzzle that Miriam's Kitchen was biting off. What they were trying to do was to move to the opposite end of the spectrum, um, to an ecosystem strategy where you would actually have more control over pieces of the puzzle but somewhat um, paradoxically, you would understand cause and effect much less mm -hmm. because there's so many moving parts. You know, what might work for one person who has mental health problems might actually not work for somebody that really needs a lot of sort of sustained financial assistance. Um, and so they were trying to move to that quadrant ecosystem, which is higher control over outcomes, but yet a, a, a much less understanding of the different pieces in terms of their cause and effect elements. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where they were trying to move. Um, and there's, as they began to do that, what it meant was, A, trying to figure out a causal model that was highly interdependent. Um, and Scott's staff, and I'm sure you'll mm -hmm. talk about this, came to him with a model um, housing first or permanent supportive housing that had been pioneered in New York City um, to say, you know, we think there's real legs to this model. But on the control side, it would mean coordinating, partnering with many, many other organizations. Um, and I had asked one of his, one of Scott's staff, Adam Rocap, um, you know, how many players are there working on homelessness just in the Washington, D.C. area? And he counted 102, so just in the DC area. Yep. So you're looking at local nonprofits, local governments, some national players, um, and so on. And we can talk more about those. But it just gives you a sense for what seems like a highly localized problem. You've got uh, over 100 organizations working on it. Mm -hmm. It's got deep roots. It's got complex interactions. But that was the shift that they were right. undergoing at the time. Yeah. So Scott, invite us in a little bit. It's um, that's a major shift in strategy yep. to think about an output-driven type of approach to now having a mission that is ending chronic homelessness yep. in Washington, D.C. Um, and then you think about the highly mobile client population, you think about the funding environment that disincentivizes collaboration, mm -hmm. um, and then even in the book it mentions you were a little bit skeptical oh, yeah. around that transition. Yeah. Like, invite us into what that Sure. Was. So as Alnor mentioned, this housing intervention called Housing First was revolutionary. And it sounds so stupidly simple now that I'm embarrassed to say it. But all the housing that had been provided before this housing model came about was really all based on people's uh, on prerequisites. You know, people being sober if they had an addictions issue, you know, stable if they had a mental health issue, sometimes employment, all of these things. And most of the folks that Miriam's Kitchen has traditionally served and currently serves are people that are defined as being chronically homelessness, a chronically homeless, or somebody who has been homeless for a long period of time and has a health problem. Um, that's always the population that we have served. And so all these other models of housing that put prerequisites on people getting into housing, they, they were almost set up for failure. You know, so when people went into housing and had an addictions issue or a mental health issue or something like that, you know, relapse is part of the process. You know, mental health is complicated and, you know, cyclical. You know, all their housing was based on them maintaining stability while they were in housing. So if they relapsed, they were out back on the street. If they had a mental health problem, they were out back on the street. If they lost their job, they might be back out on the street. And so it was a very spotty and very poor performing kind of housing that we were trying to fit people into. So Housing First turned the model on its head and said, you know, let's not worry about all these prerequisites. Let's just get people into their, a place of their own and provide them with ongoing case management support. So when DC introduced that model in 2008, 
in, in, yeah, when DC introduced that model, within the span of about two years, we got between 150 and 200 of our longest time guests housed. And that was the light bulb moment of, like, if we just had more of this housing, you know, we could potentially end chronic homelessness in DC. I was very skeptical, not of the model. I thought as an intervention it was good. I was very skeptical that Miriam's could do anything about it. You know, so we were very ensconced in our silo. We were really good at delivering these outputs and being able to kind of like hold on to a very select sphere of influence in terms of the things that we were doing. And so being, so going out there and saying we can end chronic homelessness, that's a big scary statement, a really big scary statement. And I, one of my faults among many is that I think of things a little too black and white. <laughs> so I'm like, when we say we're going to end chronic homelessness, we really better mean it, you know, like, because otherwise that's a big failure if we can't do that. And, you know, people are like, yeah, it's going to take time, Scott. You know, if we do this, here are the things we need to do. Let's explore the process by which we can do it. So that I think the key to all of that was knowing you had a solution, which is unique. You know, most social problems, you don't necessarily know there is a solution. We had scoped the problem to a point that we were, you know, looking at a very a, a small subset of the overall homeless population. We had this proven solution that other people had proved it worked. And so, you know, the leap of faith was, you know, hey, how are we going to reorient our services and develop new services to do that and get the funding to be able to accomplish all of that? Um, and that was kind of the moment of change and like being able to convince funders, et cetera, that we were going from this niche strategy that everybody knew us for to this ecosystem strategy of having advocacy to influence city council and to develop new lines of services that were outside of our traditional direct services. Um, and that was really hard in many cases because people didn't understand what chronic homelessness was. Anytime you say, we're going to end blank, that automatically creates skepticism. And I, and I exhibited it too, you know, so it automatically did. And so um, we are fortunate at the point in our, at that point in our existence, we actually had very strong reserves, financial reserves. And that allowed us to start accelerating into this strategy so that we didn't have to wait five, ten years to build, you know, this war chest, if you will, then could let us launch this strategy. We had the reserves internally that we could reallocate to do that. And we knew that for a short period of time, those reserves would be enough. We don't have those anymore. <laughs> We're fine, but we don't have the reserves that we once did. Um, but it has been that challenge because, you know, like um, particularly around advocacy work, you know, most funders on a local level don't understand advocacy. They're scared of it. There's so much other need. There are things that they absolutely are like, well, I, can, I have a million dollars and I have $25 million in requests. Why go with that scary thing that doesn't necessarily resonate with me or my board, et cetera? Um, so that's been a challenge uh, across the years. But that said, it's also had the biggest return on investment of any of the things that we have done uh, in terms of you know, getting more people to house. There are now 5,000 people who were formerly chronically homeless who are now housed in DC. And I would suggest an enormous percentage of those are due to the advocacy efforts that Miriam's Kitchen has led. That's huge. So the incentive piece is really <coughs> fascinating as we look at the funding landscape. And thankfully, you did have a war chest. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if we can zoom out. Why don't we think more funders would support an ecosystem level type of strategy? And w what are some of the um, success elements? And maybe what are some of the things you wish funders would think about differently? And I, either of you can answer. Why don't you start off? Okay. Um, so, I, I, I do think one, you know, the thing that I just said, which is the need is so great, funders are so inundated by requests for funding that they, they don't necessarily have to take a big picture vision of what we could do to move all of these different pieces in the right way to create an ecosystem. So they're not, there's no incentive necessarily for them. Then there's, I think, a different, I don't know, kind of foundation, if you will, or other institutional funder that has staffing, 
that you know they're really trying to envision you know what is what is the what is uh, their investment going to change in society and you know so I think there's a little more appetite for that kind of thing but at the same time um, you have to be willing to stick with a Miriam's kitchen for a long period of time this is not a one-off investment you know, this is a multi-year, I mean, we have not ended chronic homelessness, you know, in case you were wondering. Um, we're getting better. It's gone down substantially over the last five years, or in, in, it's at its lowest point since we started counting chronic homelessness um, in 2005. So we're at roughly under 1,400 people who experience chronic homelessness on any given day from its high point of 2,200 a few years ago. So it's going in the right direction. but. If you told me, oh, we're going to end it, or if I t had to tell a funder, when are you, you going to end this, I'm like, I honestly don't know. I know that year over year we're going in the right direction. But you know, most foundations are not apt to guarantee you multi-year funding for these kinds of efforts. And, that, and they're absolutely essential. So that, that's my, my take on it. And Elmore, what are some of your thoughts? Attribution, yeah. timing, I feel like these Indeed. are complex. Indeed. Yeah, I, I, Attribution, I think, is one of them. So, yeah. you know, everybody quite understandably wants to be able to take credit for addressing some problem, whether you're on the execution side or the funding side. In other words, you want to be able to attribute what you're funding or what you're doing to a set of results. In a neat strategy, that's possible. Um, in an ecosystem strategy, the results are achieved collectively. Mm -hmm. And so, in a sense, either everybody takes credit together or nobody takes credit. Um, and so, if you want to be out there, you know, putting out your banner saying, we did this, and sort of claiming it for yourself, in order to then attract additional resources, that turns out to be really hard. I mean, imagine, you know, if Scott went out and said, you know, chronic homelessness is down just because of Miriam's Kitchen. This would de decimate all the partnerships that yep. they've been building over the years. And right? it would be a lie. So. Right? <laughs> and it would be a lie, indeed. Yeah. Right? But the incentives um, in order to be able to attract additional resources are to be able to actually say that lie with a straight face. Um, you know, or to actually not measure adequately enough so that you convince yourself of your lie. And that happens a lot. Um, and I think the reasons for it, you know, I'm not going to judge those. I mean, I think it's understandable. Um, you know, the way that, um, that, a, that another uh, social sector leader, a woman named Marty Chen, um, there's another chapter on the book in an organization that she led called WeGo, which mm -hmm. stands for Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing. Um, they work with, with people working in the informal economy, the informal sector. Um, you know, which turns out to be a huge part of almost every major economy, <clears throat> including the United States. Um, they work with people within the informal sector, and so, and all of it is collaborative work. Um, and she's very clear, right? She was, she was reading my chapter on WeGo with a hawk's eye to make sure that there would be no signals about WeGo taking credit for that work. Because for her, what was of paramount importance was the partnerships with other players in their ecosystem. Um, and that you know, they, they will go as far as saying, you know, when they influence you know, ways in which economists will measure the labor market, um, and as a result, resources flowing into the informal sector, they will go as far as saying, we've had some influence over interim outcomes. Right? I mean, they get that fine-grained about it. Um, but they will never claim credit for outcomes in terms of improving the incomes of women in the informal economy. Um, and so they're very deliberate about not taking credit um, and for kind of sharing or giving credit to others. But that, you know, the incentives, financial incentives for attracting resources um, are not really there yet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that said, um, you know, some funders are beginning to go there. Um, and, you know, some are further along than others. Um, in a sense, there's, you can think of kind of two types of ecosystems that are fragmented, right? There's the implementation system, which is largely what we've been talking about, right? So the implementation system for addressing chronic homelessness in Washington, D.C. 
Um, but then there's also the funder ecosystem, which is also highly fragmented. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in a sense, there's a challenge at that level um, for funders to be doing more in terms of collaborative funding so that there's sufficient pools of resources to sufficient pools of executing organizations to address, address um, social problems at some sort of scale. And if you think about where funders sit within the organizational ecosystem, right? So, so anybody that funds Miriam's Kitchen, if you're a philanthropic foundation, you know, you might be giving out 200 grants um, and you tend to deal with each of them individually, right? A program officer may have a portfolio of say 20 or so, but they have a bird's eye view, right? Where they can actually see how those different pieces fit together. Um, and some funders, and again, it still remains rare, will have a theory of change for the social problem that they're trying to address where they'll say, you know, we want to work on this problem, whether it's chronic homelessness, whether it's early childhood education, whether it's the um, racial achievement gap. Um, do, do those funders have a theory of change that says, here's the pieces of the puzzle that need to go together in order to be able to address this problem? And in other words, here's the range of organizations that need to be supported and how their work needs to be integrated towards a common goal in order to be able to deliver those results. We're beginning to see movement in that direction, but it's still pretty limited. Yeah. Yeah. Partly because funders also want to take credit on their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they each have their own theories of change. Um, I would love for you all to reflect on what advice you might give practitioners, students, mm -hmm. whatever sector people may be in or going to. Um, how should they think differently about measuring for social change? I I mean, one of the things that struck me that in our ability to change, you know, our, you know, vision, our mission, and all the alignment of services, is because of the nature of funding that we had. So, because we are this, you know, soup kitchen, most people just give us general operating support, it means completely unrestricted dollars, you know, and so we had this latitude to be able to create an advocacy department, to do things, you know, that would, you know, allow us to build up reserves and things of that nature, and. You know, what I, I don't know what the advice is there, except that one of the things that I think um, would be incredibly frustrating is that if you even have this vision, this, you know, desire to change, you know, how you're strategically aligning your measurement, you may just be hamstrung by the kinds of funding that, you know, allow you to move into that different sector. Um, so I don't know how you replicate that, except that I think there is some understanding on the funding. And there are some local funders who all they do is give you general operating support. You know, they, they believe firmly that, you know, while you may, they may be interested in you because of, you know, your direct services or your advocacy, all the dollars you get are general operating support. And so, you know, insofar as people are continuing to move in that direction of continue to giving general operating support, it does allow organizations to consider, you know, what is their strategy, you know, and so, but, but if you don't have that, it's really hard to build that. Um, what I would add is, so at times I think that the most difficult challenge is not measurement, um, it's strategy. Mm -hmm. So, so even though, you know, even though my book is called Measuring Social Change, it's a cloak, it's a disguise <laughs> um, for a book about strategy. Um, and, you know, the kind of the four core chapters are about four different strategies. Um, and the main argument is that what you measure is actually really dependent on your strategy. Mm -hmm. And in addition, the kind of measurement support system, the capacities that you build inside the organization are dependent on that strategy. Yep. If you're a policy advocacy organization, probably the tactics you used to influence public policy on whatever it is, healthcare or so on, today will not work two years down the road. So you need a performance measurement system that enables constant adaptation. On the other hand, if you're an ambulance service, probably a lot of innovation along the way is not a good idea, yeah. <laughs> right? You want really clear standards of quality and clear, unbiased, highly methodical execution. Um, and so, you know, thinking about the strategy piece of it and then figuring out, so what are the right metrics? And uh, in addition, what are the right 
capacities that we need for measurement. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that is what I think is um, especially uh, essential in this. Yeah. As a reform strategy consultant, I nerded out on <laughs> the bug frameworks and all. Um, so thank you. Uh, so we'll turn it over for questions. Hi, I'm Trish Newell. I am a part of Professor Friedman's um, uh, philanthropy, power, and impact class. Thank you so much for coming. We did talk a little bit about this before coming up to this talk, and my classmate uh, Grace had a question. Uh, related to the ecosystem strategy, even when funders require certain organizations to work together, um, they may do so in name only rather than a lasting, forming a lasting collaborative relationship. Do you have any guidance as to how to ensure true collaboration when it comes, when one organization is more willing to, um, is more willing and the other less willing to authentically collaborate? That was a lot, so. <laughs> yeah. um, any guidance on how to better form these relationships um, and truly partner? I mean, go for it. My sense is that the collaborations are easier when you're absolutely crystal clear on what you're collaborating on. Yeah. Meaning, I mean, that sounds so simple, but it's, and sometimes the collaborations, you're like, what are we actually building? Are we doing this because the funder's requiring it? So, like, I guess in our situation, you know, all of these organizations that we got to, whether they believed that in chronic homelessness was possible or not, they saw all these systems changes that we were advocating as beneficial to them as an organization and beneficial to the people that they were serving. And there was the clarity about, okay, here is the path, maybe not the path, but here's the end goal that we're trying to achieve. And so, when you had that alignment around common interest and you had this clarity about where you're trying to go, I think it just makes everything, it, it makes it a much more level playing field. Um, I, but I, I imagine that can be really hard to be that clear and to figure out what are the paths forward in order to achieve that, that vision. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. It does. Yeah, the, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna bring in another philosopher. Um, so, so Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, um, is, I don't know if he actually said this, but he's attributed as having said this, sort of the English version, is that the, um, the greatest form of human stupidity is forgetting what we were trying to accomplish. Um, and, you know, when I, when I looked at Miriam's Kitchen's work, I tried to abstract out, are there core elements of an ecosystem strategy um, that might be applied in different domains? And the four that I sort of landed on um, and you can think of these as, you know, how would one actually land on these in a different problem domain? So one is actually having a, an understanding of the system, first mm -hmm. of all, right? A system framing. Um, you know, so, you know, people do stakeholder maps, but the stakeholder map is not enough. Actually understanding the interactions among the different actors becomes really key and the structural impediments to actually making progress on it. And so I think there's a need for, in order to have real sustained collaboration, for there to be a collective process whereby you reach that shared understanding of the system and the obstacles, the structures within it. That's element number one. Um, the, the, the second element um, is having, through that process, identifying an interdependent social change model, right? Which in this case was housing first, permanent right. supportive housing but actually landing on a potential solution that you couldn't attribute sort of different elements, success to different elements, but it's truly interdependent. So landing on that and beginning to get some clarity on it. So you're basically beginning to develop a shared theory of change and you see your piece of that bigger puzzle. The third is then if you're gonna execute it, you need a capacity to organize. Mm -hmm and a willingness to organize, right? So Miriam's advocacy team, they never had an advocacy team, and now it's, I think, the biggest one within the organization. Mm -hmm. So that becomes a capacity to organize, just new capacities in the organization to be able to organize and mobilize others. And then the fourth is accountability for collective outcomes, right? So Miriam's in there, I don't know, you do it quarterly, sort of your newsletter where you lay out sort of what progress you've been made. Mm -hmm. They're very clear about what targets they had for you know, housing 
uh, yep. the chronically homeless. And they're very clear about laying that out, whether it looks good or bad. Um, and you know, a national organization called Community Solutions sort of works with organizations like Miriam's to get, help them get that data so that they're not tracking the numbers of chronically homeless, but they can see it. And anyone that's a part of it keeps their eye on that ball. Um, and I think if that's there, if those four elements are there, then you're much more clear about where you're going and how you're going to head there. The challenge, I think, remains, how do we actually get these four components in place? Yeah. That's my next research project. <laughs> that's great. My name is Daniel Cunningham, and I work in affordable housing. So the question I have is in terms of your discussion, it's one thing, it's a great thing to have the aha moment where you figure out what it is where you'd like to focus next. Mm -hmm. And then you've spoken, all three of you have spoken eloquently about the symbiotic relation between funders and innovators. But I'm, I'm interested in the third part, which is really implementation and infrastructure. Because, you know, for example, in Miriam's Kitchen, does the board and does, does the staff resemble the group that was there when you first started focusing on this? Mm -hmm. and how do you get there, mm -hmm. keep funding, keep innovating, and stay to the mission? Yeah. So in terms of implementation, it was a, I think what I would call it is a bit of a culture shift. I mean, I think, you know, the sense that, you know, we were bringing in this element of the, the biggest shift in a culture was we had been so internally focused. We had, you know, I, I like to say that up until the advent of, for those who have read the book, and I encourage you to read the Miriam's Kitchen chapter, if nothing else. <laughs> Yeah, chapter five. I know that's very self-serving. But the reason it, it, I think it, for folks who are in DC, actually, it also gives a great snapshot of kind of the history of homelessness in DC, at least across the last 20 or so years. And so, you know, it was a very fragmented system, extremely fragmented. And that fragmentation was because we were all operating in silos. So, you know, we were totally able to develop, like, for example, our biggest in innovation before, you know, this mission change, this vision change, et cetera, was we doubled our meal services. We went from just a morning program to an afternoon program. So we now offer two meals a day. And that's really important and good. But, you know, it was within our silo. We didn't really have to rely on anybody else to do this stuff. And so this idea that we had to be externally facing in a way that we had not yet been was like a little bit of a challenge because you know we didn't know what that actually would mean. In fact, we had I remember one of the early forums where you know DC was formulating its first real strategic plan to end homelessness or strategic plan around homelessness uh, called uh, Homeward DC. We actually had to lobby these other organizations that had been more externally facing to be included in those conversations. We, we had to convince them that we deserved a seat at the table. And so, and I understand now, like, who, who are these people? You know, like, you know, you offer high quality services, et cetera, but you've never had any interest in interacting with the larger system, or at least, you know, in this level of the system. Um, so, you know, kind of to answer, I think, your specifics, like, in, in many cases, we had a pretty deep bench, and so the skill sets were there, you know, so we were fortunate to have, you know, Adam Rocap, who, you know, was one of the people who was mentioned, who's our deputy director now, who, you know, was, a lot of this was his brainchild, you know, and he, you know, he's still there. Um, we had a lot of other people like that who had the skills internally. We had to bring in some new staff with new skill sets, but a, a, lot, of, a lot of the backbone was already there um, to be able to support this. And some of the people have changed over time, the skills, we fortunately have found people with those same similar skills, um, you know. So, yeah, it's a different staff, but a lot of the same pieces are there. If I might just piggyback on the on the board, the board role in this, which I think is a fascinating one. Mm. Um, a lot of organizations underuse their boards strategically because they don't want the interference, mm -hmm. um, and it's a missed opportunity. Um, you know, it's a delicate one. It's hard. I understand that. Um, in one of the exec ed programs that I co-chair, um, we have these highly experienced social entrepreneurs um, from the World Economic Forum that come and they spend, um, you know, a week um, uh, with me and a colleague. 
Um, and, and I remember doing a couple sessions on boards with them. And um, the first question I asked was, so imagine if your board didn't meet for two years. What would that be like? And there was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> we would be free and we would have a lot more time. Yeah. And, um, you know, and we could do what we want. And, you know, and then, of course, then we got serious. And uh, we talked about it. And, but there was this real tension between kind of just kind of feeding the board what you need to feed the board um, to get them to go out and raise money for you and actually truly strategically engaging. Mm -hmm. And in my view, it totally comes down to the relationship between the CEO mm -hmm. and the board chair. Yep. If they don't model sort of a relationship of tough love, yep. you're never going to go in a new direction. Yep. And that can be changing balance among your board members. Absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, no, that's a wonderful question. And, you know, it's one that we can also imagine mm -hmm. asking at Marion's yeah. Kitchen. Um, you know, so, so first of all, the four types of strategies are intended as, as ideal types, right? So there's some necessary simplification. And the idea is to really get you to think and push your thinking about, you know, what is it and how is it that we're trying to achieve what we do? Um, but granted, Easter Seals, um, an Oxfam is going to be doing multiple things, right? So if you take Oxfam, which is not in the book, um, you know, but you know, they've got emergency response after an earthquake or a hurricane. Um, they're doing a lot of ad advocacy policy work. Um, they'll do a whole bunch of agricultural development work, the sort of long-term development work, in addition to their emergency work. Um, and you can imagine them sort of having elements of what they do in each of the four strategic archetypes that I identify. Um, what's interesting is that most organizations um, are actually divided into units, into divisions, um, that have pretty discrete functions. Um, and so one could ask the question at that unit level. Um, and so, you know, so, so for the folks that are doing sort of really responsible for the meal services, mm -hmm. as compared to the case management, you know, what is the strategy there? Um, and for that particular piece of it, what would be the appropriate set of measures and the right kind of measurement system mm -hmm. to support that work on a real-time basis, right? So that would be sort of at the micro level within the units within the organization that you would do that. But then there might be either cross-cutting work mm -hmm. or work that as an organization as a whole, you elevate very much at the ecosystem level. Um, and there you would want people knowing sort of their piece of the puzzle and how you maintain quality there, but then being part of that bigger conversation about, well, how does my piece of the puzzle connect to yours in order to deliver outcomes that are bigger than anything we could deliver individually? Um, and it serves both the clarification function in terms of the larger theory of change for the organization, but I think in terms of human capital, it also provides a motivational function mm -hmm. because we know from the literature on human resources, on human capital, that people are motivated by knowing how their piece, which they're always focused on, connects to something much, much bigger. Mm -hmm. And so that's useful for retaining people. Mm -hmm. It's also useful for keeping them motivated in their work. So that's at least how I would approach it. Yep. Yeah. My name is Michelle, and I have to admit I haven't read your book. <laughs> I started the course this in two days. Um, so I work for as a funder, and um, we're trying to do uh, funding in terms of an ecosystem from what it sounds like. And I run into this interference on, on a regular basis. I'll choose one of the bodies within the ecosystem to fund. I don't hold them accountable necessarily for their exact outputs, for their services. I hold them accountable for the collaborative mm -hmm. approach. 
But what I find really difficult to translate is because the other collaboratives aren't receiving the direct funding, because there's no vehicle mm -hmm. right now to actually fund the collaborative, mm -hmm. it then becomes an us versus them, and not always so collaborative. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and this means that as a funder, I measure my productivity based on the, every dollar I spend, the impact that I make. And I get, I struggle, I, I, I feel a level of frustration on a daily basis when I ask the CEOs and I say to them, well, what's the trajectory if you're not working more collaboratively, like applying for grants together, creating programs together? And there seems to be a friction, and I'm curious, based on both of your experiences, because you've got social determinants of health, you've got an analysis of a variety of different nonprofits, how do you overcome these challenges? Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's super. That's super easy. I'll, you know. uh, <laughs> so I, I think for us, it was creating a, sort of a backbone organization. You know that may not have been the direct recipient of you know, like your funding, for example, um, but it created an alignment across entities. You know, so that there was this like, I, I, I grossly oversimplify this, but. You know, so for example, around homelessness in DC, there's the, DC has a real strategic plan called Homeward DC to address homelessness. And it's, you know, now in, almost in version 2.0. I think it actually is in version 2.0 now. And um, there are actors within the system that are completely aligned with the strategic plan, the, the system's strategic plan. And then there are actors who can, are still in their silo. You know, they're, and they're, for whatever reason, they are still in their silo. And so that strategic plan allows this alignment across organizations that are part, that have like bought into it, that have said, you know, hey, we, we believe this is the right plan for addressing homelessness in DC. We are going to take these little pieces of it and contribute our, whatever our section, you know, our section of it is um, to this overall work. And so that provides a forum for collaboration, you know, at least on a systems level. And so because that strategic plan also ties into how services are actually delivered, you know, there is this share of like service, you know, production, service delivery that is, you know, kind of pieced out across the system. And so in DC's case, for example, like um, they, you know, there's the Greater Washington Community Foundation just launched this partnership to end homelessness. And it's a private fund within the partnership or within the community foundation that is now a grant making body for organizations that are in alignment with the strategic plan. You know, so I mean, I don't think they've ever actually said that. Maybe they have. And, and said, you know, you're, if you're going to get funding from us, you better be in alignment with the strategic plan. So, so this is like that incentive to do it. So I don't know how you do it if you're a funder and you only have limited funds to fund one actor within the system and just tell them like, you know, go out and collaborate when other entities don't necessarily wish to collaborate. There, there's some framework that needs to, in our case, there's a framework that needed to happen in order for that um, collaboration to really take root. Yeah, it seems, I mean, if we, could, if we could crack that problem, I think we'd be a lot further along. So I think it is, I think it's a really crucial question. And I'm not going to have a clear answer for you, but maybe just a couple ways of thinking about it. Um, you know, I think there's at least two parts to this. One is, what, is it, what does it take to get funders to think and sit and think together in terms of problem framing? and then figuring out how to deploy their resources to each element of that problem. Um, and you know, what would that kind of process look like? Um, and what would be a legitimate kind of a uh, convener or orchestrator mm -hmm. of that um, that you know, isn't trying to leverage for their own position? Um, and so there's a, I think there's almost a, a political um, shared um, purpose building there that needs to be done at the funder level. Um, and 
creative thinking in terms of how to do that. Um, because egos that are at stake as they are anywhere else. Um, the, the other part of the, of the puzzle, I think, is for funders to be more explicit about their theories of change. Mm -hmm. um, and so let me just give you a, a couple examples here. So of organizations that I have some familiarity with, um, Robin Hood Foundation and Edna McConnell Clark Foundation, very different approaches. Uh, so Robin Hood, I've written a Harvard Business School teaching case on Robin Hood that sort of looks at their measurement approach um, and their theory of change. Um, and it may, this case is 10 years old now, so it may have shifted. Um, but at the time, you know, 200 grants to nonprofits all in New York City um, with some sort of poverty fighting potential. Um, and, and, and they were very transparent about their decision making criteria, right? They would look at sort of you know, what the nonprofit was doing. They would run it through some kind of a benefit cost analysis. Um, and then they would compare sort of those benefit cost ratios. And that wasn't the only thing that they looked at. It was sort of one input into their decision making for their board. And then they would decide which ones that they thought were the most effective that they were going to allocate resources to. You know, and although Robin would kind of put a lot of transparency around their benefit cost methodology, it's not so different from what a lot of funders do because everybody is kind of making individualized assessments for individual organizations. Mm -hmm. Where I think the advance for Robin Hood was they were pretty transparent about it. And even if you didn't like the method, you could at least challenge it because mm -hmm. they were transparent about it. And I really appreciated that. And so they were looking at organizations individually and, that, and the poverty fighting potential me measured as a benefit cost ratio for that. Most funders operate this way. They look at each investment individually. Um, the alternative, or an alternative, I think there's many, is to say, well, um, could we actually look at the bigger problem and figure out what needs, what are the range of interventions that need to populate it? Um, so that, and there's going to be some organizations already in place that we think are pretty effective, that we can put more money into. And then there's going to be others that are weak. And then there's going to be other kind of niches, if you will, in that chain that simply don't exist. And we're going to create something there. Um, and because if those, all of those pieces aren't in place, this problem is going nowhere. Right. Um, and so that requires a very different approach to articulating your theory of change. And McConnell Clark as I understand it, it's not quite that far. Um, but they do sort of, they, they went from 200 grants to 20 um, and saying, look, we're going we're gonna to pick sort of problems where we think there is a real solution and organizations actually delivering that. And we're going to syndicate, we're going to raise money from a collective of other funders mm -hmm. to then give $50 million or whatever to the Nurse Family Partnership um, you know, or to some other uh, organization. because." We can't have that kind of money at scale. And that organization can't raise it at scale. Mm -hmm. But together, we could actually raise it at scale. Yeah. So just being very clear about the strategy of the funder so that everyone else understands it, and then it can be challenged, I think would be a great place to start. <laughs>